Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for a Sunday morning power Bible study. Uh, yes, uh, October 31st. Um, we've got a reading from Ruth. Yes, Ruth. And uh, Psalm 146, uh, another reading from Hebrews in chapter 9, and then a uh, reading from Mark chapter 12. Now, in our uh, lectionary, um, we're, in our first lesson, we have been getting a sampling of uh, writings that we don't get a lot of. Um, uh, the wisdom literature, we were getting a taste of the wisdom literature with uh, Job, and um, before that, we had a little bit of Proverbs here and there. Um, Ruth is not one of the wisdom writings. It is considered... Uh, it is in that category of um, of scripture called the um, the writings um, because there's only three categories in the in the Hebrew Bible and that is the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim in Hebrew. The uh, Ruth is one of the writings. Um, we in our English Bible, a Protestant Bible, we put the book of Ruth uh, between Joshua, no, between Judges and um, 1 Samuel. And there's a logic in that, but um, we can get to that here in just a bit. Uh, let's go ahead and read it, verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. So um, it basically sets up the story. I mean, there were there's a lot of biblical... The, there is a lot of biblical testimony to people leaving their ancestral home because they just couldn't get food. And so, um, I mean, that's how, that's how uh, the Israelites uh, ended up in, um, in uh, Egypt. Uh, so uh, Moab was uh, an, uh, east of the Jordan River. Um, uh, north of Edom, but um, like if you were to look at a map of the Middle East, you'll see the, the, the Dead Sea. Moab is just just to the right of it. <laughs> well, um, this man, Elimelech, and the fact that he's from Bethlehem, uh, that, hmm, what could that be about? Well, where, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert here, okay? Um, the whole story of Ruth is told because she is like the great, great grandmother or great, great, great grandmother of, uh, of King David. And so uh, this man, Elimelech, his sons, when they, uh, uh, when, when they, uh, were in Moab, uh, married Moabite women. Okay, they were. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So we have this picture then of basically three widows, three widows, a mother and two daughters-in-law, and all the men are dead. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she's saying that she had received news that, uh, oh, um, 
it's okay to go back to Judah, to Bethlehem. Uh, the, there's, there's food there. We can go. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, she's giving them an out, okay? Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal, deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. <laughs> she's surrounded by death. Naomi was surrounded by death. Her husband died, her two sons died, yeah. And all she's got left are these two foreign, yeah, that's the way she thought of them. These two foreign, these two foreign daughters-in-law is like, hey, boy, you know what? You really just should stay here, okay? Um, I'll just go back to where I was and we'll just call it a day. <laughs> just call it a day. Oh, the Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. So there's a big, you know, crying scene of departure, right? They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. Notice both Orpah and Ruth said, no, we're going, no, we're going with you. But Naomi said, so a second, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? <laughs> She's like, yeah, you, there's, there's really, there's really, no, there's really nothing, nothing that you're gonna get from me. I got nothing, I got nothing left to give you. I got nothing left to give you. You need uh, more of a life than what I can give you. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? <laughs> That's great. She's really painting a picture of, I got nothing for you. Would you then refrain from marrying? No. She's like, you gotta get real, girls. You gotta get real. The only, you've got to get a man now. This is the way life worked for women back then. You, if you don't have a man, you are nothing. You have nothing, you get nothing, you're not treated well, it's horrible. Um, no, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. It's been far more bitter for me. <sighs> She's like saying it's like to them, it's like, yeah, you, it really sucks for you two. I mean, uh, apparently they were both uh, didn't have kids either because uh, we don't have any uh, evidence that there were children, right? So it's like, it's been far more bitter for me than for you. It's like, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. So she senses a, a still a connection with the God of Israel. Um, notice the word for Lord is in all caps, L-O-R-D, meaning that it's the tetragrammaton, it's the uh, covenantal name for God. Um, and in her realm, the, there's like, she's gotten the worst of the worst from God. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. That's another way of saying Orpah had a change of heart and she decided to return. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. It's like she's really, it's, it almost seems like she's trying to uh, uh, get, um, you got, kind of get the feeling that, um, it's almost like she's trying to scrape something off of her shoe. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think she was being mean. I think what she was being was realistic. And life for her was going to be bad enough 
for herself, let alone having to take care of two, these two women who really would feel like, be like a fish out of water if they had come to Judah. But look, return after your sister and to, your, oh, and to her God. So, so it's like uh, the, they, remember Moabites were not um, uh, Yahwistic worshipers. But Ruth said, and this is the big thing, Ruth's speech, by the way, this thing that she says, um, it's one of those options that we get for weddings um, in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, things that uh, we, uh, you know, they're optional scripture readings for, for, um, for, um, um, for, uh, for weddings. So the, the context uh, in a wedding is really a lot different than what we get here because this is between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law, a, a, a non-Jewish daughter-in-law to her Jewish mother-in-law. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well if even death parts me from you. It's really quite a statement of solidarity. Um, you don't get that, you don't get that from people very often, but this was her resolve. We don't know what her motivation was. We don't know why she decides that she's gonna like put all her chips in uh, with uh, uh, staying with Naomi and going to uh, uh, Bethlehem. Um, but in so doing, we get a lesson from a non-Jewish woman who teaches us what does real solidarity look like? This is it. Last sentence. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Thus ends the reading. So apparently, uh, Naomi uh, uh, got it, okay? Uh, Ruth, you know, the the the, the I, you know, you, have you ever had those communications where um, the, the thing that was said to you was so clear and there was so much resolution behind it? Like there was no inkling of, this, they're, they're not joking around here. Um, Naomi got it. She listened with integrity with what Ruth had to say. She took her at her word and she didn't even bother to try to talk her out of it. So, um, uh, the so the book of Ruth. So it's, it's going to go on, and she's going to she's going to uh, end up uh, 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 marrying somebody in um, uh, in Bethlehem in Judah, and um, uh, eventually she is mentioned in the genealogy. At the very end of the book, it mentions that you know the connection with King David. And so the book of Ruth kind of, uh, it starts out with a statement, in the, in the days of the judges, um, well, the book of Ruth is put in between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel. What's 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel is about basically King David when he was a, a youth uh, in the, the, early, the early monarchy. So Ruth is like this, this, this hinge book between those days of the judges and the time of the monarchy. And, and it's bridged, uh, ironically enough, with a non-Jewish, uh, the story of a non-Jewish immigrant, okay? Um, uh, a, a resident alien, if you will. Um, did you know that Ruth is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in uh, the book of Matthew? Yes. Uh, she's one of a few women that are mentioned there. 
um, all of the women that are mentioned. There's a little, a little bit of a scandal behind them. I mean, and you got to think of, remember this, she, Ruth, she was a non, non-Jew. And the fact that um, God chose her to be a part of that lineage, there is a bringing in of the elder, of, it's like, it's like the, the idea, there's no such thing as a pure race, okay? There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a pure race and a pure ethnicity. It's like, we're all one, okay? We're all one. We can pretend otherwise, but we really are all one. And this is one of the main emphases of the Book of Ruth in, in its abiding value. Okay, we're going to move on. Psalm 146. Remember, the Psalms are, uh, they tend to go along with the Old Testament reading. Uh, this one is no different. Uh, think of Ruth when we hear this. Hallelujah. By the way, hallelujah is a Hebrew word that is untranslated. If we were to translate hallelujah, we would get praise the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God. Kind of think of uh, Ruth in um, cashing in, you know, taking a, you know, putting herself all in with, with Naomi and Naomi's God. She was basically saying, I'm, I'm gonna take this God of yours, it's gonna be my God. I'm just, I'm good with that. So happy are they who have got the God of Jacob for their help, yeah whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. See, food to those who hunger. What was the motivation for the movement in the book of Ruth? Yes, famine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow. She said a story about three widows. But frustrates the way of the wicked. This is a, uh, an exclamation of, of trust. We know, though, that... The wicked do get, they do prosper at times, yes, um, but um, we don't, the Psalms aren't so much concerned with reality as they are with creating a world that we would aspire to. Verse 9, last verse of the Psalm. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, we're moving on. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. Now, um, uh, the, remember, the book of Hebrews is written to a Christian congregation of ex-Jews, Jewish, historical Jews, what, however you want to think of it. Like, they... They are going through some tough time. They have, they have declared Jesus to be their Messiah, and they're, they're, they're like, nah, I'm not so sure, having second thoughts on that. And this is a sermon to this, uh, uh, this situation, and there is imagery from the Jewish uh, temple rite with the offerings and such and the, the sacrifices and all of that and the high priests and all of that that the, the, the writer is just really going to town with and showing how Jesus is this grand fulfillment of 
what God was doing in Israel through Judaism. It's as though, it's as though our writer is saying, Jesus isn't a new thing. Jesus isn't a, 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 a diversion. Jesus is a fulfillment of everything that Judaism put out there. This is what God was doing. In essence, what our writer is saying is to follow Christ is to follow the way of, that he started in, in, in Judaism. It's not a diversion. Don't hold back, he's saying, he has been saying, Keep going with Jesus. This is the direction that God is going. This isn't a new turn. This is just the last development in what God had intended all along. There's no... Christianity isn't an offshoot, is what our writer is saying. Christianity isn't an offshoot of Judaism. Judaism is the seedbed uh, that produced what God was wanting to do in Jesus. This is what our writer is saying. Okay. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Okay, so Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come. That's an interesting thing. The, 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 I believe our writer is equating this current age of Christ, uh, faith, whatever you want to call it, um, of non-dependence on the, the temple rituals, as all of those things about the good things that have come. Uh, notice this word, it says, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, it's called the perfect tent, okay? Didn't use temple, didn't use temple. Why didn't he use the word temple? Well, there came a time when the wilderness experience, the, 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 the wanderings in the wilderness, remember that time uh, in um, the latter the part of Exodus and um, uh, all of Leviticus and Numbers, where they are in the wilderness and they get shown uh, the building of the tabernacle and the tabernacle and the tabernacle and the tent are the same thing, okay? Um, there's an idealizing of like, now that's when things were, that's when things were best. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, a strain, a strand of thought in uh, the Old Testament that, you know what, the temple, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, there's, there, there's that. Uh, there's definitely that in the New Testament as well. The time in the wilderness and the tabernacle, the tent, uh, of me, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the, uh, all of that, that period gets idealized, okay, as being a time of totally dependent on God. The wilderness experience became for Israel that nostalgic thing to look back on and say, oh yeah, I remember that was before we were in the land and we really had to trust God. We really, we had no, no, and we didn't even do a very good job of that. Remember the stiff necked people thing? Anyway, so this is the illusion that our writer makes is to this, the tabernacle time. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. He entered once the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Okay, okay so um, blood is 
uh, so, and in another place, our, our writer says, you know, without the uh, without the spilling of blood, there is no uh, there is no salvation without the spilling of blood. Well, this doesn't refer to the fact that God is bloodthirsty; that God needs death. Blood represents life. Blood represents uh, that 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 essence of life that um, that. Um, that is in the purview of God. That's the reason why only God uh, can, could take, uh, it, was, it was seen that only God could take human life. Uh, human life was uh, considered to be a, a, in that realm of like, to spill blood on the earth. It was like, uh-oh, we're gonna have to do something to make things right again. Yeah, so, um, for if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer <laughs> sanctifies though those who have been defiled so that their flesh is pur purified, how much more will the blood of Christ? How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works? to worship the living God. So our writer is equating Jesus with not only being the high priest, but also being the sacrifice, okay? This is a... Uh, a new way of thinking of it. Um, never would a high priest have ever thought like, oh, I wonder how, what kind of, how this would work if, uh, if I was the one who was being sacrificed. No, nobody ever thought that. Jesus became the sacrifice the, because in our writer's mind, his blood was divine and therefore, Far superior, yes, than that of goats and bulls. All right. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Dead works. Um, uh, one of the things that our writer is uh, keen on is... Um, uh, making sure that we are seeing that we don't need to revive the temple worship, the temple, the, the works that, that, in the sanctuary that, that uh, were used. This is, our, <clears throat> this is our legacy to celebrate in what Christ did so that we don't have to worry so that we don't have to uh, think like, oh, we need to reconstruct the temple. We need to start all of us. Like, no, we don't. Not necessary. And this is a theme that is consistent with early Christian preaching. Okay, uh, that we see in the book of Acts and such. All right, we're gonna go on. We're gonna finish up with our gospel reading. Mark chapter 12, verses uh, 28 to 34. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked them. Now, we get a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, people questioning Jesus, um, people uh, trying to entrap Jesus. Um, this interaction is rare in that the, the scribe that comes to him is, um, in, in that the scribe that comes to him isn't trying to entrap him. One of the tests of a good teacher was how quickly can you 
summarize the psalm, the, 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 the Mosaic teaching? Well, I, I'm just reminded that one time of that, that there was a teacher that said, okay, uh, good teacher, you know, and Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Well, notice, there, and those, those are like a little bit can, cantankerous from the beginning, but this one is not, okay, not at all. It's a genuine, it's a genuine inquiry and not out of intent to trap or to like prove wrong, but just to like, but this is what we do. Uh, we see, put each other, put each other, you know, on the spot. Okay, how about you? Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Um, by the way, this is a typical, um, this is the Shema. The Shema literally means, hear, O Israel, um, and with all your strength. The we don't see in the Old Testament with all your mind. This is something that seen, appears that Jesus is adding. Um, so the, the question is, what is first of all? And he says, and the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is a summary of the Ten Commandments, by the way. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the, the, the top four and the bottom six, or the top six and the bottom four. One, the top has to do with loving God, and the second has to do with loving your neighbor, basically, if you look at the Ten Commandments that way. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, <laughs> this is interesting, it's like, he's like totally like in agreement. So he's gonna say, you are right, teacher. Rabbi, that's what teacher means. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one neighbors as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. What? What? Yes. Um, this statement that, okay, he, he basically repeats everything Jesus said, and then this is the thing, this is like the jaw dropper when he says this, is like, oh, this is more important. It's like, yes, yes it is, isn't it? It's like, uh, I could just hear Jesus say, like saying, responding in that way. It is, isn't it? This is, this is what I've been trying, this is kind of what the Hebrews writer was, uh, is saying. This is the theme of, of the prophets, um, uh, especially the prophets like uh, Amos, and uh, Hosea and uh, Micah, the ones who are very much really getting in with it, like, oh, you are concentrating on the wrong thing. You think that your religiosity is what is going to um, get you closer to God, but what's gonna get you closer to God is by being what God wants you to be with regard to other people, yes. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Get Jesus' response. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. So we have a rare interaction between Jesus and an authority whereby there's a meeting of the minds. It wasn't all adversarial to Jesus, remember. Um, yes, the early church struggled because the ex-Jews or the, the Jewish people that, that were there and the, they, 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 were like, they started to get, yes, there was conflict between uh, those who had been Jewish and those who had been Gentile. But in this interaction, we get a, a, a kind of a, like a, an understanding 
of like, oh, there is a place, there is a common ground here. There is a place for recognizing the value of, uh, of, uh, of, of the prophets, of appreciating what the law said and the prophets, and it doesn't have to be adversarial. We can actually be together on this. We can actually be unified on this. This is what I'm seeing in this interaction. And um, uh, this is uh, in the middle of, remember Jesus is in Jerusalem now, right? And um, he's already, uh, this is that time when uh, the Holy Week stuff is, is, is um, we're amidst that, okay? And um, in Mark's narrative, he presents so much conflict and so much uh, vitriol. It's refreshing at this point to actually see like, oh, how about that? Um, there is actually some concord going on. We haven't seen a whole lot of concord. No, I haven't seen a whole lot of concord at all. You are not far from the kingdom of God. It, that could be referring to the fact that um, he could be saying like, well, um, if, you, if you're thinking like I'm thinking, then um, yeah, you're pretty much there. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I think this is a lovely, uh, a lovely example of how I think I, yeah, I kind of was talking about this when I was talking about the Hebrews passage, right? That the, the, it doesn't have to be all vitriol between uh, Judaism and Christianity. Um, there's no, there's no, absolutely no, uh, no reason for anti-Semitism. Um, there's a, there, there's a, a commonality. It's in the recognition of the validity of the prophets and and the the teachings of Moses. This is one of the reasons why, basically, that I, I'm doing on my Wednesday night teachings. I'm I'm teaching in, uh, into the prophets right now because those the prophets came about as people trying to provide a corrective, preachers, ministers, if you will, providing a corrective to the overboarding, overboarding, overboard the uh, go, having gone too farness of with the. Uh, the, the, uh, the interpretation of the law and the legalism, okay? Jesus represents one from that tradition while also upholding the status of a teacher like Moses. Moses, he is Moses and the prophets. That's, that's, that was the significance of the, of the transfiguration. Uh, remember, Moses and Elijah, yeah. So, uh, that's it for today. I'm just going to call it quits there. Blessings, and until next time, shalom.